right, everybody. I think we're going to get started. Uh, welcome back from lunch. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, it's nice to have that hour off. And, and now we will have a very lively discussion to keep you from your post-lunch nap. Uh, I have a few little announcements to make before we get started. Uh, first thing is um, in your folders there are two forms, one for um, the caregiver registry and there's also a form for documentation of permission for us to contact you. If you are interested and would like to sign up for either of those, please fill those out and we have boxes by the doors to leave that you can drop those off in. It, they're basically just forms saying that we can contact you either uh, for a a research study or we can provide um, email updates, uh, especially things like our, our research and our conference um, information. So those are uh, in your folders if you're interested. And then um, also uh, to, to tweet again uh, with the hashtag CPWML and um, I will be checking, and if I see any any tweets with that, I'll be it'll be amazing, and I will I will personally be like I can't believe this is here, but um, that'd be great. Uh, and also, this is not really a housekeeping thing, but just a personal thing. I apologize. I have a cold, and so um, I will be hopefully holding it together and not coughing or um, sneezing or you know uh, losing my voice during this presentation. So. Um, if I do, please bear with me and know that I am absolutely dying of embarrassment. So I also have cough drops that I will be popping probably to avoid any of that. But anyways, um, okay, so those are our housekeeping things. Now on to our presentation, which I'm so, so, so excited about. So this panel that we have here, these individuals are the most amazing advocates that you could ever, I mean, I, I can't believe we were able to assemble such a great panel. You guys are amazing and I'm so, so happy that you're going to be here to share with all of the audience your stories. Um, so we will we'll get to the actual talking from, because actually this is probably a really good thing that I am, you know, don't have much of a voice today because you guys will be doing most of the talking, which is nice. So our objectives, which are here and very academic, um, but what I really want you to, to leave here is, is knowing what the experience is like living with memory loss, how we can best support each other, what we can learn, just, just soak this all in because they're gonna have so much good information for you guys. All right, um, so I wanna do some quick introductions. Um, I guess I should introduce myself. I'm Robin Berkland. I, I obviously work at the U. I, I work with Tamara, actually. We're both study counselors um, on that residential uh, care transition model module. So um, that's what I do. Now, what these individuals do is just more amazing. So we have Daryl Foss. Daryl, he not only is a chairperson for the Minnesota Working Group for Alzheimer's Disease, which is a huge initiative. There are so many subgroups and then subgroups of the subgroups, and he's in, in charge of it all. <laughs> uh, he also works with the Minnesota and South Dakota, no, North Dakota, sorry, South Dakota, the North Dakota Alzheimer's Association for the Early Stage Advisory Group and the national one as well, which is just amazing. I mean, you just have your hands in so many pots and, and you we're willing to give up a Saturday to come in here and talk with us, so I, I really appreciate that. We also have Virginia, Virginia Lackin, who, am she's amazing, she is an author. You should go, first of all, before I forget this, there are business cards too. She is an author and she has a website that she posts personal uh, journal entries, blogs. I mean, it's just, it's amazing stuff and you really should go check it out. So she has some business cards that you can get the, from her and check it out because it's amazing. But she's written books, she's, she has an MBA, she's, she's just awesome. Um, so we also have Jane. Jane Ching is a professional storyteller. So when I say that we have an awesome panel here for you guys, we have a professional storyteller. This is going to be amazing. So yes, <laughs> she's like, no. Uh, yeah, so Jane is here um, to tell about her stories too, um, and 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 some of the things that she's she's concerned about, and some of the joys, and that's really what we wanted you to take home with you is the positives and the joys of, of of living with memory differences. And then we have Ken, and Ken is here, and 
he has his hand in every pot as well. He is also a member of the National Early Stage Advisory Group for the Alzheimer's Association, and he participates in fundraisers, and he participates in support groups. And, oh, I forgot to mention, you're in the chorus, too. Sorry, Daryl's in the chorus. I forgot to mention that. Uh, what a, oh, educational programs. I lost my train of thought there. You are just in everything as well. And it sounds like in your spare time, you are busy gardening and playing basketball and tennis. And Jane's doing her art. And I don't know that Virginia has spare time because she's writing so much. But I guess that's, you know, like part of it too. So uh, I want to get to you guys and get you started. I'm going to switch over to the chair here just so we can make this more a casual experience, but everyone here is going to tell their stories of, of their journeys. And then after that, we're gonna go to, and some of the, these questions will be a part of what they're talking about. Um, and then after that, um, we have some questions that we figured would be really good for you guys to, to hear the answers to. And then after that, we'll do the traditional Q&A where we'll have people in the crowd with microphones and they can come up to you and um, you can ask your questions. So that's what we're looking at, okay. Daryl, do you want to start with your story? Sure. Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Daryl Foss. Um, I'm, I'm a Vietnam combat veteran and was a crew chief on a Huey helicopter. I have been followed at the Minneapolis Veterans Center since 2008 for memory issues. I have annual neurological exam, MRIs, driving tests, and various other exams at the Minneapolis VA. On June 11, 2015, the clinical nurse specialist informed my daughter, Mary, my spouse, and me that I had mild cognitive impairment, MCI, Alzheimer's. It was devastating to me, the feeling of helplessness and hopelessness, not knowing what the future would bring, how long would I remain independent? Would I still be able to do my annual whitewater canoe trip? This was answered two years later. My whitewater wilderness canoe trips have come to an end. This past February, I capsized three times in two days on the Rio Grande. The nine-day river trip ended up being only four days. I could not plan execute, think fast enough or clearly enough to paddle the Rio Grande. And of course, in all of this, I was in denial. Mary helped me to accept the diagnosis and is a motivator that keeps me moving forward. The Minneapolis VA medical clinical nurse explained a number of things that we should do going forward with my diagnosis. Stay socially and physically active and eating a healthy diet. The clinical nurse specialist registered us for living with dementia at the Minneapolis VA. It was three two and a half hour sessions scheduled over three months. The sessions provided us with information about Alzheimer's dementia. We had speakers from the Alzheimer's Association, a neurologist, an elder care attorney, occupational therapist, and other experts in the field of dementia. The clinical nurse specialist suggested that we register for the HABIT program, Healthy Actions to Benefit Independence and in Thinking, at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. By the end of 2000, July of 2015, we were registered for the two-week program. The habit program helped us how to <clears throat> utilize the habit calendar, discussions about the disease, statistics, yoga, and eating healthy. I work very hard with embracing the helpful memory aids provided by the habit program. I make references to my calendars seven times a day. Thank you.
Virginia, do you want to tell your story next? Sure. Is this close enough? Can you hear me? Yeah. <clears throat> um, actually, so much of your story is my story. Um, I, we too, my husband and I, also went to the Habit Program. Um, the day after my 70th birthday, my daughter, my son, and my husband asked to meet with me. And um, they were very concerned about, about me and about my repeating things and telling story and, and my recipes not turning out. And they wanted me to see a, to go to Mayo and see a specialist in memory care. And I, w I was so angry with them. And I accused them of overreacting. And um, I was very resistant. But at the end, I did promise that I would make an appointment because they reached out and held my hand and said, Mom, we're with you on this journey. Um, so I did go to Mayo, and I was diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment. And um, like you, I, I focused a lot on the future. Oh my gosh, what was going to happen? What was going to happen? Um, we learned the skills in the habit program. But I'd like to spend just a few minutes to say how I've progressed in the last couple of years. Um, um, Robin asked me to talk about things that, that help me. Some of the things that really help me is identifying what are my stressors. And while we're encouraged to socialize, crowds are not good for me. I just, I can't, I, there's too much going on. I can't remember names. Um, but socializing one-on-one -on -one or two people or a small group of women that I go to and, and meet with annually and monthly um, are really, really good for me. Um, I have decided that um, Robin didn't know she should mention our book, but I am an author, and my husband had prostate cancer at age 49, and I wrote a book about... Um, how we got through that. He became impotent, and nobody talked about in, imp, impotency or lack of intimacy, and so I decided that it was time to break that silence, and I wrote a book and told how we finally realized how to get our intimacy back. And um, the University of Minnesota, their program in human sexuality, heard about our book, and we now speak to the males, <clears throat> the medical students um, we have every year for 10 years about, about intimacy. And now it's moved not only from prostate cancer, but intimacy and aging. And when I was diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment, I was embarrassed, I was ashamed, um, and I didn't want anyone to know. But after I thought about it for a while, I thought this is exactly how I felt when we were struggling to get back our intimacy. And nobody was talking about it. And I used the phrase, silence does not serve us well. And I thought, OK, I did this once. I can do it again. <laughs> and um, so I do. I have a, a website now and a blog. And I am a writer, and I write about how this feels and what I'm experiencing and um, some things that help me. And I'd be happy to have you all read it. Um, my daughter's sitting here in the audience. And I'll just tell you one thing that has made a really big turnaround for me. Um, and I, I wrote about this, and um, was that I was always saying to my husband, I'm sorry you have to drive me. I'm sorry you have to do the grocery shopping. I'm sorry you have to make the meals. I'm sorry I'm a burden. And one day I started writing about when, and he had two cancers after that, so he was hospitalized quite often. And I started thinking about how when he was ill and I was taking care of him, I never ever heard him say, 
that he thought he was a burden to me. And I thought, if somebody had said, oh, I'll take care of him for a while, I would have fought them tooth and nail. <laughs> and so I thought, oh, I need, I need to take the, that advice for myself. So now I say, thank you for driving. Thank you for making dinner. Thank you for shopping. And thank you for being such a good caregiver. All right, Jane. That's a hard act to follow. <laughs> um, well, I was the first one who noticed my symptoms. I kept completely forgetting what I, things that had been recently talked about, and I began having trouble with simple math. Um, I was having trouble learning and remembering new information. Following directions, both written and verbal, was becoming increasingly taxing. In 2013, I approached my general physician when my memory lapses first began. It was sort of an exit interview since I would soon be moving out of state. She administered the mini cognitive test. Basically, she said I did show some si concerning signs of memory loss, but perhaps it was just due to the stress of getting ready to move. When I settled into life in Minnesota and was still experiencing memory problems, I brought it to the attention of my new internist. The mini-cog results were similar. I was referred to a geriatrician. He ordered blood work, an MRI of my brain, and more thorough testing by a neuropsychologist. Even though I suspected something was wrong with me, when I heard the words mild cognitive impairment, precursor to Alzheimer's, I was shocked and terrified. I figured my life was pretty much over. Um, do you want me to you could. do everything that you asked me? You don't <laughs> have, no, you don't have to. That could be good. I'm sorry. You can, you can stop now if you like. Okay. And we can go we'll go that. more. Okay. Sure. Yeah. However you want to do it. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll just stop for okay. now. <laughs> okay, Ken. I'd like to digress. I'd like to digress for a, a moment. I uh, got up this morning at my regular time and got on the computer as I do most days today because I wanted to see the results of uh, the uh, French tennis tournament open at Roland Garros and check the scores. And lo and behold, a pop-up came on the screen that I had never seen before and it was labeled Alzheimer's Organization slash Brain Tour. So write that down. I have never seen an explanation as good as that presentation was in my 10 years of journey with Alzheimer's. As to you hear all these terms on about synapses and uh, tau and all of these other terms that are used, but it never tells you how that affects what's going on. And it goes through 16 pages of different uh, scenarios of what, what happens. And I just, I uh, recommend that you look that up because like I say, it's one of the best I've ever seen. Uh, I was diagnosed nine years ago, I think it was. Uh, went to a, my GP and, and uh, my lovely wife said uh, she thinks I have had problems with different <laughs> things and uh, I probably did. And she ref referred us to a, uh, a uh, neurologist. <clears throat> Went to the neurologist and he looked at us. And this was, this was uh, uh, late 2080s, I guess, something like that. And it, uh, we were under quite a financial pri uh, problem at that time nationwide. And uh, my income had dropped significantly. Uh, but anyway. Uh, he said, yeah, uh, I think you're depressed and you probably have Alzheimer's. Uh, take, t <laughs> take these pills, we'll see you in a year. That was it. And I'll tell you, you come out of a beating like that and, and I, I, you get what they call the Ds. You're in denial. You're defeated, defiant, 
degraded, disgusted, demolished, demoralized, and you do have depression. <laughs> so after that, we've kind of gotten more into it. My, my um, wife talked to different people. I was on a study that I couldn't get into from the University of California at Davis for uh, six months. So you sit there and say, oh yeah, I got Alzheimer's maybe, I, but I can't do anything for six months. Well, we uh, decided to uh, move to Minnesota to be with our grandchildren and our daughter and son-in-law and uh, got very involved with the Alzheimer's Association. Uh, and actually, what's funny is you, you never know where to go. A friend in California told my wife, gee, you ought to talk to the Alzheimer's Association. Nobody told us that here. And the Alzheimer's Association is really, really uh, the optimal place to, to go. Uh, since then, I've gone through tests and all kinds of different things, but uh, now I go to another neurologist locally that I've been through the HABIT program also, like many of these people here, and fantastic program. And uh, that's how I was diagnosed anyway. See you next year. That was it. Uh, I hate to clap after that. I, I hate to clap after that because yeah. like, I was diagnosed with you next year. Yay. But that's not what we were clapping for. Um, so uh, we're going to go through, and I'm going to ask some of these questions up here. Um, as I said, some of them have already been kind of talked about. And I want to be really mindful of time so you get your, your full 30 minutes of, of Q&A after we're, we're done. So... Um, all right. So, and Daryl already gave me permission to use the hook. He, he's like, use the hook on me if I talk too long. So we got that covered. So, all right. So we've talked about who first noticed your symptoms. We've talked about uh, how did you know when to get, but what were your next steps? I mean, what did you guys, what did you do? Daryl. Um, I don't know what question you what were you, after you were diagnosed, what did you do? What were your next steps? Uh, what were my next steps? I think um, you know, stepping back a little bit, um, it was Mary, my spouse, who really noticed uh, the symptoms more than myself. Um, how can you say that? Mary's my spouse. <laughs> that may be something to discuss later. <laughs> uh, I, I either uh, ignored my memory lapses or just thought it was a part of aging. Um, but my, my spouse strongly encouraged me to go in and get, di get a diagnosis back in 2008. Uh, she was really the, um, she basically knew something was wrong. Uh, she had thoughts of a stroke or brain tumor or any other kinds of things that may be going on. Um, and actually it was quite a relief when we finally found out that it was only mild cognitive impairment Alzheimer's. <laughs> <laughs> Because um, now we knew what, what it was and we could kind of move forward with my care plan. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw something out at you guys that we hadn't talked about, but in our last presentation, there was a lot of talk about how to work with someone who is in denial. And I've heard a lot of that mentioned up here. Do you have any advice? How would you... How were you best? I mean, it sounds like Virginia, from what you were saying, that you were, you were kind of encouraged by your family by them saying that they were there with you. Was that what you said? Is that what kind of helped you to move past the denial, or at least to, to go check it out? Not initially. <laughs> okay. Okay. So it still took some work. I, I, I was still mad at them. Okay. Um, I accused them of overreacting, but but I did promise to to get to be seen. And when I too got the diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment, I remember thinking, 
oh, it's mild. You know? <laughs> no big deal. Grasp um, at straws, right? And I, I am going to react a little bit when you say what, what happens after your diagnosis because um, I was diagnosed by a psychiatrist at Mayo. We live in Winona, so Mayo is very easy for us. We always doctor there. And, and my daughter was with me when he said, oh, you have mild cognitive impairment. And that's kind of what, you know, there was nothing else. Come see us in a year. Um, and then sh a few months after that, I was seeing a gynecologist. And um, she was asking me questions, you know, when was your last period, blah, blah. And I said, you know, I have to tell you, I, I really, I have memory issues. And I can't, I can't remember those dates. And she said, oh, and I said, I've been diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment. And she said, oh, my fellowship is in, is in um, memory issues, so I'm really, con I'm really interested. And she said, have you been to the HABIT program? This is at Mayo. I had seen a psychiatrist. <laughs> and I said, I know I don't know anything about it. She said, oh, you have to go. And so um, I went back to our primary, and I said, oh, she said I should go to the habit program. And he said, oh, the habit program. He was a young resident, actually. And he, oh, yeah, this would be great for you. <laughs> So then I went to the desk, you know, where they schedule you. And I said, I need to be scheduled for the habit program. The habit program. <laughs> oh, yeah, OK. So it was wonderful. And I'm so glad we went. But I keep thinking, I try not to keep thinking about it. <laughs> um, what if I had not seen this gy gynecologist? And I have told my physicians at Mayo, Something is missing here, so I'll just leave it at them. <laughs> yeah, the, the working group I had talked about that, that Daryl is the chairperson of, one of the working group subgroups is on public awareness, and that is one of the things that is being talked about a lot in that group is getting information so that there's something like so that you know when you get a diagnosis, here's what your next steps are, here's what you can do. They should have known that there was a habit program. You should have been sent out with, oh, see you later. So in a, a year, I mean, it really, there should be some information. There are so many. We have so many resources and so many support services that that should just be part of, of our, our procedure. So. Yeah. I think for me, the, the denial part, uh, I, I'm probably still in denial. Uh, I think there's times, much like you, I, I think, uh, well, I'm pretty good. I'm, I can remember this. I can remember that. I can do this. I can do that. Um, but for me, it's been really more of an acceptance that I do have the disease and kind of trying to move forward with advocating for the disease. And, and really, the, the key word that I've used off of time is uh, it, it really gave me purpose in retirement, uh, which before I was maybe floundering around a little bit. Yeah, that's a really good perspective. It really is. And I think that, again, that's one of those things that we really want to try to share, too, are, are those, the purpose and joys, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Actually, you know what? We don't need to go in the order of the slides. We can talk about that since we're talking about that. Why not talk about that? So purpose and joy. So do you want to share some more purpose and joy that you have found, or d does anyone want to talk about Ken? You know, I, I, as far as denial is concerned, uh, a lot of it is fear. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're told, or I was told anyway, uh, you're going to get lost. You know, that was a matter of fact. You're going to get lost. Uh, you can't drive anymore. Uh, you know, it just you, you you become less than a person. And I and I don't think anybody likes to be told that. So that that's. And, and when you leave it, you think you got a, a big A on your forehead that says <laughs> Alzheimer's, and everybody looks at you, you have Alzheimer's, you know. But I, I, I belong to a woodworking group at the Edina Community uh, Education Area, 
And there are probably about 20 guys in there, uh, younger and older than I am. And uh, I've told them all that I have Alzheimer's. They could care less. <laughs> yeah, they all got their own problems. <laughs> you know, so that's what I think it is. You know, you get so f afraid that you're going to be singled out in some manner. And uh, I found that's not true. But still, I know a lot of people feel that's true. Yeah. And I think, I think some of that has to do with that initial diagnosis and how that's presented. And, and, and there's like, OK, well, you're depressed. You have this. Go. And, and not with any kind of like, and this is what you can do. And I think that's one of the things we want to talk about, too, is, is to focus on strengths and, and abilities and, and what you can do and not just thinking of it as this is taken away and this is taken away. And that sounds like, you know, just like a blanket statement that that was made, like, oh, you don't get to do this anymore. And there's really so much you can. And to, to have that first, you know, diagnosis, that first moment not be one of, of hope taken away, but of like, hey, you know what? Yes. And this is what you can do. Um, Jane, do you want to talk about your, your purpose and joy? Um, well, I continue to live the best life I can, as long as I can. Uh, we've done a lot of traveling. In fact, we've traveled a few times with some good friends that we met through Alzheimer's, and the couple, one of the couple also has Alzheimer's. And it's, it's a, it's a um, wonderful thing to have these people that totally understand what's going on and... Um, my favorite <laughs> uh, explanation for that is when you're, when you're in an airport and you go to the restroom, you know you can go in one door and out the other. Well, for someone like me, if I go out the other door, nothing looks familiar. <laughs> so my friend will come with me and she'll get me back. And Shanshin does the same for the guy. I mean, I think, I think that's, that's really important. Yes. Um, I no longer tell stories. I was a professional storyteller, but that doesn't mean I read the stories. It means I performed, I told the stories. I can, I'm afraid now to do that. I think I'll get in the middle of the story and forget how it ends, and I'll just be looking at people. So, so I don't do that. But when I did that, I was, I was always comfortable in front of an audience, so I can still do this. You know, that's, that's one of the things. I, um, I continue to do my art. And I've made a couple, couple quilts with the very patient help of some good friends. In fact, I made a quilt for my granddaughter's bed. I had never done anything quite like this before. And my dear friend, who I've known, known since we were little kids, she would say, oh, she'd say, OK, cut here. And then she'd bring me a pile of stuff and say, pin this. And then she'd bring me another pile of stuff and say, sew here. But I got it done. And I can say I did it. But I get by with a lot of help from my friends. Um, and I, I serve on a lot of committees for the Alzheimer's Association to help them raise money and to figure out what, what should be done for us, how, you know, how the um, legislature or the government should be treating us or programs that would be good for us. It's fantastic. Yeah. Well, I've been in, uh, involved in a number of Alzheimer's panel discussions, speaking uh, with audiences about my journey. Uh, and this really has to do with kind of having a purpose in my life. Um, as Robin mentioned, I'm also uh, serving as a representative of people living with dementia and as the chairperson for the uh, Alzheimer's Disease Working Group for the state of Minnesota. And it was a 16-member Alzheimer's Disease Working Group is reviewing and revising the actual 2011 report preparing Minnesota for Alzheimer's. The budgetary, I can't remember, the budgetary, <laughs> social, and personal impacts. And uh, this will be a report that will be given to the, uh, the 2019 state legislature. I have lobbied with our district uh, U.S. representative and senators, as well as Minnesota state representatives, um, to continue and increase uh, research funding dollars for, for Alzheimer's. In fact, in a couple of weeks, I'll be traveling to Washington, D.C. for the 2018 forum 
to meet with our federal representatives and um, senators to lobby for, again, increase in research funding um, to, the, to the tune of $425 million, which will get the NIH up over $1 billion in research dollars for Alzheimer's. And the other uh, ask that we're having at the forum is going to be the looking for support for the building our largest dementia. It's got the little, every, you know, everything around here has got to have kind of an acronym to it, you know, and it's called the BOLD Act, right? And uh, it's the Infrastructure for Alzheimer's Act, and it's been introduced in both the House and the Senate. And currently we have 33 co-sponsors in the Senate and 121 co-sponsors in the House of Representatives. So that, uh, that again will be another ask that we will have at uh, the 2000, the foreman. As Robin mentioned, I'm um, also with the uh, Alzheimer's Association, an early, st early stage advisory group and the Minnesota chapter. Um, and again, I participate in the Alzheimer's walk to end Alzheimer's, raising dollars and everything. But I think all of this stuff that I'm doing has really uh, helped my memory. Um, again, it gives me some purpose, and I think it's the mental stimulation that having that, so I think it really has caused me to go into my cognitive reserve on a lot of that. It's not only helping you, it's helping everybody else, too. <laughs> That's really good. So um, I was going to switch our slides there. So uh, just some, some basic talking about daily living and, and kind of what, what you've been encountering with it and, and any difficulties, any special tips you have, um, anything like that. So. Um, Virginia, we had talked a little bit about this beforehand, um, about the stressors that you encounter and kind of how you've been dealing with that and how you've changed your approach to dealing with daily living stressors. Um, yeah, I had, to, I, I had to sit down and identify what did cause me stress. And as I said, crowds did. Um, making my recipes did. I just finally had to say, you know, it's just too much trouble. I can get through them, but I have to read them and read them, and then they don't turn out. And so I, I just kind of have given those up. Um, traveling can be a stressor for me. Um, I, I, I can't travel by myself except, um, as I said, we live in Winona, and I can get on the train in Winona, and I can go to Milwaukee, where I have college friends that have been my friends for 50 years, and they meet me at the station. And that four-hour trip just feels like heaven to me <laughs> because I'm by myself. I feel like I'm capable. I'm doing this. No one's around me. No, you know, it just it feels such freedom because I no longer drive. Um, but there's been a couple of things that I specifically have done, especially with my family and friends. And I think um, to begin with, being able to tell people that you have memory issues is the, you have to start there. Um, otherwise, how do people know? As I say, my college friends, I just wrote a, a blog about this, that they, they take care of me. I'm one year younger than them, and I remind them of that all the time. <laughs> And now they take care of me like I'm their little sister. And at least once a year, we all go uh, we take a trip somewhere. And they do all of the planning for me. They, they remind me. They just hover over me um, so that I don't get lost and that I get at the right place at the right time. And that is so comforting. Um, that you can have friends like that. But there's a couple things I've done with my husband and my family. Um, one thing is if they will just, you know, how someone will say, oh, mom, remember, whatever. And if I say to them, mm, I don't remember that, I've asked them not to try and give me hints because that just annoys me. <laughs> You're like, well, remember that. No. Uh, well, remember it was that? No. 
So if I say, I don't remember, now they just drop it. But if, I, some, if something in my head says, mm, maybe I can, I'll say to them, eh, give me a hint. <laughs> Tell me more. And a lot of times I can pull that one out. But I, need to, I needed to let them know this has to be our clue. This is a, what I need to say. And the other thing that has really helped is um, my husband is a fixer. And um, he, I know it frustrates him that he can't fix this for me. But he, also, he wants to step in a lot of times. If he sees me struggling with anything, he wants to step in and fix it. And I've asked him to say to me, do, do you want me to help? Do you need my help? And sometimes I'll say no, and then sometimes I'll say yes. But at least I'm in control of if he's going to step in or not. And the other thing that, um, that has really helped is if I'm having a bad day, or I'm sad, or um, kind of feeling sorry for myself, or struggling with something, and I start, and I and I, I start to say something, and then I stop, or I say I'm really I'm really struggling today, he'll say, "Tell me more." And it's such a wonderful phrase. Instead of, "Oh, it's okay," you know. <laughs> It'd be all right. But, it, but saying, tell me more, actually allows me then to kind of go a little bit deeper. This is, this is why, oh, because this happened, and that's why I think I'm sad. Or I'm just blue today. I didn't sleep very well last night. And that, that kind of helps me name what's troubling me, that little phrase, tell me more. And I, I'm... A, a firm believer, if you can name something, it loses its control over you, or at least part of its control over you. So those are the, um, the hints that, that we've developed in our family. Excellent. Those are good. It's really good to know that. And I think everyone here can kind of take that home and, and see. And it may not work exactly the same with you guys, but you may be able to put your own spin on it and find something that does work. It's, it's great. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add something um, about telling people. I firmly believe that you should tell people when you have when you have this thing, um, especially your family, your close friends, your church groups. It's in your best interest or my best interest for these people to know what's going on with me because they'll watch out for me. And they have an explanation for why <laughs> I've asked them the same question six times. Um, I've never regretted telling anyone. And I'm always really moved by the support that I get from them. That's really good. I'd like to uh, give you all a test. <laughs> this is everybody that goes for these tests has to do. All right, now we're going to start from 100, and everybody count backwards by sevens. Come on. When you get to 37, let me know. Nobody got to 37. Well, maybe you should get tested here, you know. It's, uh, I've had a different experience because I have gone through so many tests uh, spinal taps, radiological, where they inject radioactivity into your blood and look at your brain and brain scans and everything. And they say, definitely you have Alzheimer's. There's no question about it. You have all the things. But I don't have the symptoms. And they don't know why. Uh, the reason I've become so active is that when we first moved here from California, we met a couple that was from California through the Alzheimer's Association. 
and uh, this young fellow was an attorney, had Alzheimer's, 42. Two kids in high school. Uh, that was uh, eight years ago. Today he doesn't know his wife or his children. And I'm here really because I, I, I have to talk for him because he can't talk at all. And there's so much research that has to be done to find out what, what is the cause and, and how are we going to cure it. And it's a, it's a mighty task. I know we're trying to get money through the Alzheimer's Association to, to do more testing, uh, more funding. Uh, if you haven't looked at the statistics, cancer and heart disease far exceeds all the testing money than Alzheimer's has. Yet they say in 10 years it will f far exceed the need than heart disease and um, anyway, that's all. Um, I, I think we've touched on most of these in our uh, kind of our talking. So I'm going to just keep going to make sure that we kind of breeze through them all. We have talked about purpose and joy. All right, I have heard uh, these are recommended services, and I've heard a lot about Alzheimer's Association just from our, our panel up here and the Habit Program. Those seem to be two really good supports. Um, what other supports have you guys found that have really helped or um, even anecdotally if you've heard of other people going to? And, and I think that's them? one of the big problems. There are a lot of resources out there, but there's no list of what these resources yes. are. You find out about them anecdotally. Yeah. Uh, we found out about a program... Uh, uh, through the Wilder organization, which is headquartered in St. Paul. And it's a really a fantastic organization that had, still offers a lot for uh, Alzheimer's people. And uh, I've gone to several of their uh, classes that they have. They have like six-week classes, eight-week classes. And it's not only, maybe I didn't need them, but you get to see other people and where they are, where they're coming from, and how you interact with them. I never forgot, I had a, a very good friend I met through there that uh, I was in the Naval Air, he was in the Naval Submarine, we should talk about Navy stories. And uh, uh, he's as big or maybe a little bigger than I am. Being on a submarine my size is tough. <laughs> you get a lot of scars on your head. <laughs> Uh, and he was a real me too rough guy and we were starting to do art and as far as he was concerned that was not going to happen <laughs> and uh, I would sit next to him I said oh, I'll play around do this do that you know. and pretty soon after six weeks he was into art you know so you got to see these new experiences that you can gain through other adventures, you might say, are uh, very beneficial. Absolutely. Um, in Winona, we, our city has uh, begun a program of called being a dementia-friendly city. It's a program that's traveling across the United States. And um, they had the kickoff a month ago, and Dr. Gogler was down there and spoke, and then I was the keynote speaker. And um, the paper covered it extensively. And the day after the kickoff, one of the restaurants in town posted on Facebook, we are dementia friendly. And they had pictures of their menus, so that uh, their menu items. And all of their staff was there behind this. Um, and the, the point is that people should feel comfortable we talked about this in, in the kickoff, that if you're in town and you're not sure where to go, that you can walk up to someone or go into the store and say, I have memory issues, can you help me? And they will say yes. And they'll, so that the whole town understands the breadth and depth and width of, of dementia and that it's not something to be afraid of and that we're all in this together. And so 
I recommend that program. Excellent. Uh, Ken and I both sing in the uh, McPhail Center of Music in the Giving Voice Chorus. Um, and it's a chorus made up of people with dementia, Alzheimer's, MCI, uh, their care partners, support partners, and volunteers. Um, I'm also in the Giving Voice Ensemble and a Giving Voice Barbershop Quartet. And there's both choruses in uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul. And in fact, outside, Mary Leonard is here for the Giving Voice Chorus. And she was telling me there's now, I don't know, 21 or 22 choruses around. And there's two or three of them now actually in Australia. Uh, another one that I'm involved with is it's, uh, that I enjoy a lot is uh, meeting with our partner in dementia. Uh, a first year medical student at the University of Minnesota Medical School who has been walking this journey with us in the past year. Uh, there's a, actually a number of partners in dementia. Um, your students with us today over here. Why don't you stand up and say hi? <laughs> Anybody else from out here? Um, actually, I still do. I, I was recently chosen to go on a four day fishing trip up to Ely, Minnesota with uh, 35 other veterans from around the state of Wisconsin and Minnesota. Uh, and we had a very good time uh, conversing about our times in the military. And uh, uh, we actually caught some fish in the last <laughs> evening. <laughs> the last evening we were there, we actually had a wonderful fresh fish fry. That was really due. Uh, I also, uh, like Jane, I still do my acrylic painting. So those are some of the activities I'm still involved in. That's excellent. Jane, do you have any programs or services? The, um, one of the other programs that I'm involved in is mentor calling. OK. So people have called the Al Alzheimer's Association, and they just want to talk to someone who's also going through this. And they leave their name, and once a month I go in, are you doing this too, Daryl? Yeah. And uh, I have a list of names to call. And I think it's just really comforting for those people to know, you know that they're not alone in this. A lot of these people live in small towns. They don't have all the resources that we have. And yes. uh, th I, I really enjoy doing that. Yeah. yeah. A lot That's of them excellent. are from outstate. Yeah. I thought it was very interesting in my calling. I talked to a gentleman whose wife had been diagnosed and uh, being new to the area, I didn't recognize the zip codes or anything like that or the prefixes. So I asked him where he was and he was from farming area far west from uh, uh, where, uh, far east or far west south of where we are on a farm. And he says, well, we, we've just sold the farm. And I said, why? He says, I have to move closer to uh, Mayo for my wife to get treatment because we have no facilities out here at all. I was thinking, I grew up in the boonies. And I say, just think having to sell your farm, you know, where you lived all your life to get care, and, and that really made me think. Uh, I never forgot that conversation. It was, uh, to me, very, very profound. Yeah, there's, there's definitely, that's another thing that's talked about in the working group with public awareness and risk reduction is, is just the discrepancy between the amount of services that are available in the cities versus out in rural areas and how it's just, it's so difficult. And, and the other thing is writing that list up too to, to make it available. There is the senior linkage line, which does have um, a lot of services. I mean, it's a great resource, but having one from the state that is on the website for Alzheimer's dementia and says specifically, okay, this, here are resources in your community and, and making sure that that is, represents rural areas as well and getting that information out in hard copy too, so you don't have to go on a website, but just having that available because there really are a lot of resources and that you're right, it's, it's, uh, it's hard to track it down. You have to kind of go here and there and, and everywhere. What, what is that again, the what site? Uh, the Senior Linkage Line. And so you can, it's, um, you can get on their website, but you can call them and they have a lot of information too. Because so. like I say, we found out everything just totally anecdotally. Yeah. You talk to somebody, they know something or they've been it, told something. 
that's the way. There, that's the you, way. You just I can't know. find out. And it shouldn't be like that. We yeah. should be able to do a better job. I think the physicians, when they diagnose you, should give you that. Exactly. That that's what we're saying. That's exactly, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. They uh, you should give you the number for the Alzheimer's Association, mm -hmm. and they should give you that information. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's what we're talking about. That, that should be in your hand when you leave, so you're not like, mm -hmm. well, what do I do next? You should yeah. have the information. For other illnesses, you have that information when you leave, what your next steps are. Right. Let's do that. We can do that. We can do that. Yeah. Um, all right. The, the other time. thing I've been involved in or have gotten involved is in uh, kind of research uh, for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, Ken and I were both in uh, one called the Ideas uh, Study, which is... Imaging dementia, I'll have to look in my notes, I'm sorry, I don't remember. Um, amyloid scan, imaging dementia, amyloid scanning. scanning. Um, I've also, at the University of Minnesota, I was with the, um, the, the, Univ the University of Minnesota and uh, veterans on an MRI study which was measuring antioxidants in the brain uh, with people with and without Alzheimer's, um, and it was kind of a three-hour MRI uh, measuring antioxidants down at the molecular level. Uh, so that was kind of just for me an interesting study. Yeah. Uh, I fell asleep in the MRI. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm also in an observational study at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. It's a long-term observational study. Uh, which I go down once a year and they uh, go through a whole battery of three days of testing for uh, a, a major neuropsychological exam. Uh, again, with uh, what Ken was talking about, uh, radioactive isotopes that they inject in you and it's uh, called a PIP and the tau and the glucose and then they actually do PET scans of your brain to see the, the amyloids and uh, tangles on how they're doing, and it's an observational study for overtime. Okay. That's great. And there, there again, it's like when I said in the introduction how you are such a strong group of advocates, you really, I mean, that participating in research, that's another way to be an advocate, and you're really, you're really helping us understand what's going on. And if you're interested in getting into any of those programs, the Alzheimer's Association uh, has the... Um, uh, I don't have it here in my notes right now, but it's the. Um, Is it? Yeah. Trial match. It, yeah. Trial match. Yeah. Trial match. Trial match. Yeah. Trial match. Trial match. There you go. Trial yeah. match. Uh, yeah. And uh, and you can sign up in there, and you can uh, get into some of the research programs. Yeah. You know, kind of the research is what's going to get us out of this morass that we're in. Right. So I, I, I skipped over healthcare because we've already kind of talked about what we want the professionals to, to know and be able to do. Um, family and social support, we've kind of talked a little bit about too. Um, and we can talk about more that that with the Q&A at the end. Um, words of wisdom before we open it up to the audience. Do you guys have any gems that you would like to share? Anything well, that you think people should know? Well. This is something I want to um, direct at healthcare professionals. Um, first of all, if you're a physician, I want to know I have this. There are a lot of doctors that actually don't tell their patients they have Alzheimer's or that they suspect they do because there's nothing that can be done. They can't give a prescription to fix it, so they just don't tell. And we're losing a huge opportunity to plan for the rest of our lives and live the best life that we can. And if um, you're working in a facility, I would say, if I was in a facility and I needed, I needed care, I would want something, somebody to know about my life, know yeah. a little bit about my background, what interested me, and Absolutely. yeah, take the time to do that. Yeah. I think that's, that would be really important. It really helps to build that connection and, and personalize your care, for yeah. sure. And yeah, it's like very you said, <clears throat> try to avoid saying the word remember. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because the yes. minute someone says, remember, I'm already telling myself, of course I don't. Why did you even ask? <laughs> 
So um, it's it's better just to just start a conversation with me instead of instead of say that. Yeah. And even as far as um, as what we're do what we're doing today, what's on the, what's on the calendar? Instead of saying remember, <laughs> <laughs> just say in the morning say. At two o'clock, we're going to do this, you know. And because from my poor husband, I'll ask him <laughs> at night, "What are we doing tomorrow?" And he'll tell me. And so I know when to set my alarm. And the alarm goes off, and I'll say, "What time are we leaving the house?" Because <laughs> <laughs> right, it's that short-term thing. But right. once once you realize that, um, the people that are living you, once they realize that, then then it's easier to manage. Right. Yeah, they can adapt and modify. Mm -hmm. But I think that remember is that's a, that's an important piece to for us to know because it does it not only kind of puts you at a like you, on the defensive like oh I should remember something and it's important and I don't but it's such a way that it's just a natural way for people to try to make a connection like oh remember that time like it just you want to say it like that because it's building that connection. So it's, it's a natural it's hard. thing to say. Yeah, it's so just it's hard. for us. It's it's hard to hear that because yes. immediately we kind of shut down or right. we're talking to ourselves. So it does saying, exactly what it's I not don't. supposed to do. <laughs> it's supposed to build a connection, and instead, it you know. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, one of the articles I just read recently was they talked about rather than do you remember kind of uh, is to to bring pictures. And uh, show pictures rather than uh, say, do you remember, or show somebody a picture and then talk about the picture as right. opposed to saying, do you remember when, um, as a, a little aid to, right. to remember it. Um, I think one of the things I'd like to say is, uh, you know, kind of for people new, newly diagnosed is there is life after the diagnosis. I think that's... Um, the important, um, the important thing to remember, I mean, thinking back of the time when I got my diagnosis, you know, I, like Jane said, you know, I, I thought they were going to be signing me up for a memory care unit next week, you know. Um, and, um, and we still do a lot. I mean, we, my wife and I still bicycle, we travel. But it's all done with some accommodations. You have to make some accommodations, uh, you know. And I think a lot of it is you need to get creative on what you're doing. You know, do things that you've done in the past, and kind of do some new ones. I, I think the other thing I, I have to share one little story with you with my uh, neurologist in uh, at Mayo Clinic uh, after being there and going through all these tests and everything else, and he was talking about he really felt badly about, um, you know, having to give this diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment and, you know, how, how tragic it is and how bad it is. And my wife and I both piped up, oh, no, I says, don't feel that way. You know, we've met some of the best friends through this journey. That's true. That's true. So it's sort of like if you're given, you know, lemons, you got to make lemonade. Right. Yes. Yep. I have uh, one thing that we talk about is that if you've seen one person with Alzheimer's, you've seen one person with Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. We're all different. So you can't, everybody has different challenges. Uh, I know I have different challenges than Dwight, and, uh, or Daryl, pardon me. What's his, what's his name? <laughs> Frank? <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's, it's, uh, you know, I, and I have what I call selective memory. <laughs> I, I remember things I really want to remember. <laughs> it's the other things I don't remember. <laughs> so, uh, Mary Margaret all, can attest different. to that, Ken. Along those same lines, I, I think it's perfectly fine to ask someone um, what's the best way that you like to be communicated with? Do you want to be communicated orally and writing in both ways? Um, I have a friend now who, whenever we have a phone conversation and we're making dates, she immediately follows it up with a recap of what those dates are. And uh, again, I put that in one of my writings. I thought, this is so kind and so helpful to just follow right up. She doesn't even ask me. This is what we talked about. Does it sound the same for you? Um, and I said, yes, keep doing that. So I think... 
you know, uh, as you said, all of us are different, and I think some of us, I think we, we need to be respected for that difference and asked, what's the best way to communicate with you? That's fantastic. Well, I think we're going to open it up to to the audience now for for questions. So if you have a, if you have a question for our panelists, just raise your hand, and we'll have the microphone come around. There's a couple down here. Yep. Is this a simple one? I, when Daryl started speaking, I um, did you say that you first went through a program at the VA that be before you went to the Habit program? Yes, yes. I was diagnosed at the Minneapolis Veterans Medical Center in, in Minneapolis. But did you go through a program there that was helpful to you? Yes, there was also at the time they had a, a program there called Living with Dementia. Uh, that was the, the three two and a half hour sessions um, over three months. Now, um, the person that was in charge of that unfortunately retired. <laughs> <laughs> and I have heard now, um, if you contact their Ed Ratner, Dr. Ed Ratner, um, he, uh, he is resurrecting that program, I believe, at the Minneapolis VA, the last I heard from him. I just wanted to make a quick comment that I work for Hennepin County, and we do long-term care consultations. And so that's a free service for anybody. And you can get all kinds of information during a two-hour care consultation. And you don't have to be poor. You can be any income level. And it's free. So just as a resource. OK, thank okay. you. And it's through any county. Any Call your county of service. Okay. And you'd have a, a nurse or a social worker um, come out and visit with you and give you ideas, resources, supports, recommendations for um, your uh, home, you know, about grab bars, uh, things that they should be aware of that could be a safety issue, you know. So That's great. just want to tell you about the resource. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Yep, a long-term care consultation, and every county is assigned to do those in Minnesota, and they're free. That's okay. Wonderful. And if you're eligible for a service, that's fine. They do eligibility also, or at least they'll consult with you over the phone if they don't think you're going to be uh, eligible for a service, it can at least give you resources over the phone. Some counties do that instead. That's you great. Know, so that's an idea. That's wonderful, too, that it's in every county and not Every not county. Just the that's right. And some counties collaborate together. And they have one number to call. The senior linkage line would be able to give you the number for any county, I believe. OK. OK. Uh, the, other, the other service that's available for to you through the um, the county, particularly if you're uh, an ex-service member, is the uh, county service officer. Go see them because there is an awful lot of information that's available through the county, through the, the county service officer that for military veterans uh, specifically. I just wanted to ask if Virginia could give us the information from the floor on reaching her blog in case we don't get a chance yeah, to get her business card. Oh, there you are. Oh, it's Virginia Lakin, V I R G I N I A L A K E N dot com. You're welcome. Thank you for asking. I wanted to. I wanted to say that um, I'm Ken's wife, <clears throat> and I, I am. <laughs> Who has but, Alzheimer's here? Yes. And actually, um, Daryl and, and Ken of I have become best friends. We're besties since all of us grew up five miles from each other in Iowa. <laughs> we didn't know each other at the time, but we're reliving our childhoods now through memories, so it's, it's been fun. But um, I have to say that Ken, as a, as a caregiver, I'm number one his wife, but as a caregiver, he's been my inspiration. It is not easy for caregivers, as I'm sure all of you know. Part of the reason it's been, uh, he's been such an inspiration to me is because he's in denial. And so, <laughs> <laughs> and, 
And, and he is determined to be as normal as can be. And I allow him that independence because I would prefer that he be as it's independent. It's tough for driving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, driving, yeah. There's no, there's no conversation <laughs> regarding that. But, um, Lovey, I wanted you to, I was hoping that you would give your philosophy because you, you usually say, and maybe you're saving it for the end and I'm, I'm spoiling this, but Ken has always said, I'm going to live every moment of every day the best I can. And so I have embraced that philosophy as well. Most days. <laughs> <laughs> But it, it really, it just makes a difference in, in how we live day to day. I thought I might make the comment since we talked about driving. I don't drive. And in some states like California, if you're diagnosed, your driver's license is automatically terminated. It's not true here. However, uh, for some reason, I, after uh, we were here four years, I had to take a driver's test here. And uh, I don't know if any of you have had to take one up here in north, somewhere north of Minneapolis, where it's a closed course, there's nobody on the road at all, it's just the people taking tests. And uh, I passed the written 100%. I take the driving test with this gal, and. Uh, do everything she said, and she said, uh, now, uh, uh, parallel park. And I parallel parked, no problem at all. On a hill, put the tires to the wheel, everything you're supposed to do. She says, okay, let's go. So I turn around and look, and it's a closed course. There's nobody else there. And so I pull out, oh, she well, you didn't use your traffic, your signal. And I said, well, signaling means you're trying to communicate with another person. <laughs> if there's no one there to to communicate with, you're really not signaling. Flunked. <laughs> I'm still very angry. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, is it on? So thank you to the panel, because I think it's really important that we see the variability, because if you have one term, cognitive impairment, it flattens everything out. Everybody is the same, and what you've shown us is a lot of variability. So my question is, um, is there something like the Habit Program in the Twin Cities? Even part of it? Yeah, they're working on it. Uh, the Habit came out of... Uh, uh, Rochester, and I went to one here where they brought all their people up here and did it for, what was it, two, two, 10 days, something like that. And it got to be pretty uh, tough on them. And now they're trying to do a, a you might say, a road show. Because uh, the Habit was very, very uh, interesting and I thought educational for everybody. Now, uh, Daryl, did you take it down in Rochester, Habit? And I don't yeah, I believe they only did that one in uh, Twin Cities just the one time. No, no, oh, oh, okay, so we did one in the Twin yeah. Cities. Okay, so, you, so so I have a suggestion for uh, any activist in the in the room. This is already in progress. It's it's not anything that has to be reinvented. It just has to be moved, and um, not moved out of Rochester, but just cloned. So that shouldn't be that hard a problem compared to getting something started from scratch, right? I would think so, but you know, the, they own the quote the rights of the program. The, the, one of the nicest things, you know, you do a lot of things you never had done before. We did yoga. I'd never done yoga before. I think it's great. Well, even <laughs> knowing what the components are, because uh, there there are yoga programs here. True, but. So people could do individual pieces here, maybe, but just to know what what the p components are uh, would I, be a step I forward. It, I think it's very it would be very easy to find the components. Um, there's nothing that Mayo did that I would say was oh no one else could do this. 
Um, it has to do with meditation, yoga, eating, exercise. Um, the calendar. I will put that in my blog. Yep. Yeah. What? But they do actually require that your that your caregiver be with you. That's a requirement. They also do um, a section on calendaring. Yes, which actually, which is really important um, because and we can't live without our calendars. Yeah, the calendar is the basis. And again, um, your your caregiver Keith keeps the calendar. We go over it every morning. Um, yeah, that's that's a life. Yeah, it really helps. <laughs> it helps. Yeah, I'll be happy to put it on my blog. Thank you. very involved. In fact, Ken and Daryl are on his advisory council, as are Mary and I, and so we have been encouraging that. Um, and it's there's a, a meeting in the, at the end of June, and we're hoping that that's going to be on the docket for uh, upcoming programs out of um, Health Partners. Uh, I got just one little thing yeah. on the habit calendar. Um, it's if any of you are familiar, it's it's a lot like the uh, uh, Covey's uh, daytimer calendar. That's a lot like what the the calendar is all about. And I think, as Ken mentioned, I think most of the uh, you know I have a three ring binder full of everything that we did at at uh, the habit program, but it's all copyrighted. I have my iPhone. That's my calendar. <laughs> I was uh, going to just mention that what uh, Mary Margaret just uh, said, uh, you know, that uh, Health Partners uh, is uh, in the process of uh, starting a similar program. I think, I don't think they can just take Mayo's <laughs> program and duplicate it, but somehow that's, but then, also, in addition to the habit program, I think the first program Jane and I uh, participated was actually suggested by the, our geriatrician, and it's called Memory Club. Okay, it's not identical, and it's a, a, I think it's a ten or twelve week program meeting two hours uh, once a week for you know for 10 12 weeks and then it involves uh, a number of topics that's very similar mm -hmm. to that you know how how to deal with it financially and then <laughs> nutrition you know etc and then so you know that would be something to look into and that is uh, sponsored by the Alzheimer's Association, but it's held in a number of uh, locations within the Twin Cities area. Okay, for you. That was, it's called Memory Club, if you yeah. didn't hear that part. Thank you. You have been trying forever. <laughs> Question. I mentioned about the um, driver's license, and that's what I'm sort of interested in from any of you. Um, does the driver's license and the ability to drive with the diagnosis always, or did you figure out beforehand that you didn't feel safe driving, and then you surrendered your license, or is your license taken from you? I just need to know a little bit more about how that worked for any yes, of the you. the first thing they told me, you can't drive. You're going to get lost. You know, that, that in the initial diagnosis, that's what they told me. I can drive perfectly. My wife doesn't think so, but I, <laughs> I, I, uh, I've been driving since I was about 12 years old out in the boonies, so. Uh, but uh, I think uh, uh, driving is, is a big issue, and, and for some people. And I took uh, through... Um, I think it was through the, I uh, know uh, it was through the, my doctor, Dr. Rosenblum, had me take a driver's test, which I passed all the way through. But driving is a, is a, a you know, it's a dangerous thing for somebody who is 
100% cognitive. So if you drop a little bit, you know, you look at the accidents on the road today, you don't want to be involved in one. And there's liability issues involved also. Uh, the, the state of Minnesota will not uh, arbitrarily take the driver's license. Um, your doctor needs to suggest that you be tested as to whether or not you have the skills that you need to drive. Now, you, you, you can refuse to take that test, but then you can't drive if you don't take the test. You may take the pest, test and pass, and then you continue to drive. If you fail the test, then you, you can no longer drive. So the reason I, I suspect that if I took a test, I probably could have passed it, but the reason I stopped driving was I was getting lost. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and maybe my daughter would say, I probably couldn't, she is, her eyes are telling me, no, you couldn't have passed it, Mom. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'll say maybe I thought I could have, but I was getting lost, and I, and I thought, this is not safe. And actually, I was finding myself being really, uh, you know, I live in Winona, so I'm not driving in traffic. But um, I was getting really anxious when I was driving, and I, I, I knew I wasn't safe. But again, the kids and my husband insisted, and again, I was mad at them, you know. <laughs> Um, and even now, I think, oh, I think I could drive, but then I think, how would I feel if I hurt someone? I, I, I can't risk that. I so I do have a driver's license, but I don't use it. I haven't given up my driver's license yet. I, I still drive locally in our, our local area, like I'll drive to the the Minneapolis, I live in Egan, so I drive to like the Minneapolis VA or I drive to the zoo or I drive to the grocery store or things like that, but it's only in the daytime. Um, in fact, next week I'm scheduled to, again, at the Minneapolis VA to take a driving test. Um, I just wanted to say that I really wish that my mother was here today to hear you folks. Um, she has an almost 40 year history a participation in a 12-step program. And she has done for that program in her life what you folks are doing for uh, dementia and Alzheimer's today. And I, I'm, I'm convinced that if she could take the, the pride in what you're doing to her heart, that she could be up there with you and finally let go of her denial. But, but I don't know how to encourage her. And I, and I don't know if there's an opportunity for her to, to participate in, a, uh, in something like this. Uh, I'll tell you, Thank you, for me, it took a lot of work and energy <laughs> to hide. A lot of work and energy. And when I stopped hiding, it's, you know, I thought, oh my gosh, I don't have to, I don't have to, be on guard all the time. It's it's so relax. It's so rewarding to be able to say, "I know Beth. I know I've asked you this before, but you know, as opposed to try what did I what did I tell her? I can't tell her. I just can't remember. <laughs> That's it's so stressful for me. It was so stressful. I think for me the the, the easiest part is you know not remembering somebody's name now is just saying, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, you know, I have memory issues, I can't remember your name. And uh, most people are, uh, you know, quite helpful about that and uh, uh, telling you who they are. Because uh, I remember faces, I just don't remember names. I solved that problem. I just say, hi, Guy, how are you? <laughs> um, the Courage Center uh, in Golden Valley has, um, T driving testing. You make an appointment, it's not automatically reported to the state. It's a voluntary thing. So be, like before you got that, you could do it. There's a sliding scale on it, but it, you know, like it's if you're having somebody that, you know, is on the fence, you say, well, then just take the test. Go te take, the, take the test. And it doesn't automatic, if you fail, it doesn't automatically take away 
your driver's license. You know, then you have some option to do it. So we've looked at a lot of different um, practical solutions. Um, we use the uh, chores and more through Anoka County, $20 lawn service. Home program out of Minnetonka, $20 to have somebody come do your lawn or your snow. They also have volunteers that will come and like rake your leaves or do that. Um, rebuildingtogether.org, they have the safe at home program. Free installation of grab bars, security lights, locks, handrails. So um, I would encourage everyone to look at your local community um, action program is usually through the county. And that, like she was saying, call and get the long-term care consultation. Because asking the county for help is not always economic. You can also um, apply to a program called alternative care that's not um, not so much financially based, but you pay about 15% uh, of house cleaning, um, meals on wheels through optage, um, y you know, chore services for your outdoor work. Anyway, just, you know, that there's a lot of programs out there that, yeah, you don't, you don't know about. So. Okay. I think we have time for one more question. Um, Bringing this kind of back to the morning session that we had around long-term care planning, I'm wondering what kind of conversations you're having around long-term care planning and if you have any tips for other family members about how to have those conversations. Uh, well, we've had those con I'm sorry. Go, no, go ahead. Uh, we've had those conversations and in fact, um, we're in the process right now of downsizing. Um, and uh, we're moving into a, 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 a senior cooperative. Um, it will be about a year from now um, for kind of the long-term care. We've also had the conversations about, you know, if it gets to be a point of, um, you know, where you, when you got to be put someplace, where do you want to go? Uh, so I've actually, uh, there's a really nice state-run uh, veterans home up in Silver Bay. So uh, we've, we've talked about that's where I'll go, and I'm overlooking Lake Superior. Nice. <laughs> Keith and I have been avoiding that conversation, uh, but we do talk about it. And uh, I actually said on my blog, just, um, I've, I said, I'm going to check them out. So... Now I put it in writing. <laughs> <laughs> we went to a meeting yesterday with uh, uh, our new senator, and I can't think of her name. What's her name? Tina Smith. Tina Smith at her office yesterday. And what was one of the big things on the uh, menu that we were talking with her uh, associate that was there and uh, the cost of long-term care is astronomical. Um, we're, one of the gals there is looking at 10 grand a month. Now, how, how long can you do that? Uh, personally, I, uh, I tell my wife, when I get to that point, take me down to the river. And uh, we have to get to that old... Uh, existential philosophy asking the question, is it essence before existence or existence before essence? And uh, it depends where you are. To me, when you, when you get to the point of existence, you have to cease. Because I don't know where, where uh, I just think it's a it's such a tremendous bad, uh, burden, not only with the relatives, but government as a whole, to support people for 20 years in a vegetative state of not knowing where they are. Mm -hmm. All right, any, any final words before we, maybe something a little more positive? <laughs> 
Well, I, I got, let, let's uh, end on a little song? bit more of an upper, should we? Yes, <laughs> yes, Daryl. Yes. Um, one of the things that my wife and I did with, uh, with the driving thing is, um, you know, she does a majority of the driving now, but I got the keys. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much. We appreciate this. It was so fantastic. Thank you very much for being here, for sharing your story so much. We have one more presentation that will be on in about 15 minutes, about 2.30. So you can take a little break, and uh, we'll see you back here. You guys.